So welcome everybody to today's lecture. What we're doing today is we're going to be talking about um, our, it's our last lecture actually on white box testing and today we're going to be talking about uh, fault-based uh, coverage, specifically mutation testing. And I alluded to mutation testing in some of the previous lectures um, and it's an interesting one because unlike uh, some of the others like with code coverage where you're trying to cover the, all the statements, make sure every statement gets executed or with the data coverage, making sure every definition and every use of variables get uh, covered. Um, when we're talking about mutation testing, we're talking about trying to provide coverage of all of the possible faulty versions of the software that you could create. Uh, and each of these faulty versions, which have each have a single syntactic change, is called a mutant. Um, today what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about what is mutation testing? And we're going to talk as well about um, how mutation testing is used. And we're going to lastly, we're going to talk about some different methods of mutation and some examples. Uh, also want to try something a little bit new today. I'm going to also use uh, stylus and that just to see if I can explain things a little better because I often use the board a lot uh, when I do this lecture when I'm in person. So thought I'd try something similar. Uh, when I'm doing it now. Um, okay, so what do I mean by mutation? Well, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the way mutation testing works is uh, with mutation testing, we have our software system and uh, we have our test suite. And if we run our test suite against our software, make sure all the bugs are fixed that our test can detect, what we're interested in is doing is seeing if that test we have is good enough to find other faults, uh, namely ones that we seed into the program systematically. And when we do this, we actually use our test suite with our on mutated or our original code as sort of our oracle as our to compare the mutant values with. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to use mutation of that source code to create a set of mutants and for each of those mutants, we're going to run the test suite and see if it gets the same results as the original. Uh, if the results are different, we say the mutant is killed. Uh, otherwise, we say it's still alive. <coughs> um, so let's actually kind of take a look at this. I'm going to, because I think this can sometimes be complicated. So uh, what I want to do here is just actually switch views. And let's actually look at this here. Um, I think everybody should be able to see my view now. Um, so what I want to do here is I want to, let's just draw this out. So normally, let's say I have a software system here. Let's, um, oops. So if this is my software, forgive me if, so this is our software system, let's say our program P, right? So for a program P, what we typically do is we have a set of tests here and these are our tests okay and what we do is we feed these tests into our program and for this program we get for each test we get an output So if there are four tests, we get four different outputs for the program. And those tests, we can see if each of those outputs is correct or incorrect. Now, um, assuming we've actually fixed any problems in our program P, okay, what we're going to do now is we want to see how good is this set of tests, right? So our goal here now is what we want to do is we want to evaluate oops evaluate tests okay so we want to evaluate those tests here that's our goal at this point okay and so what we're going to do now is what we want to do is we want to create a whole bunch of mutants so we're going to take this program p okay we're going to use something called uh, usually an automated tool call we can call it a it doesn't really matter a mutant generator let's call it and 
And what it's going to do, it's going to take the program P, it's going to put it into mut mutant generator, mutation generator, and what it's going to produce for us is a whole bunch of mutant programs. So it's going to produce some other program, let's call it P1. Okay? And it's going to produce P2. And then it's going to keep going and it's going to produce a whole bunch of these mutants. Okay? You with me so far? So we've got basically our program, it's created all of these mutants. And remember, each of these mutants in it, somewhere in the program, it has some little syntactic change. So it's some little bug is in this program, and some little bug is somewhere in here, and there's a little bug somewhere in here. And each of these have a little bug or a little mutation, which is supposed to differentiate it from the original program. So the next step that we want to do is we want to see how good our test suite is that we have is at those tests, same ones that are right here, we want to see how good those tests are. So what we can do is we'll actually take these down and we will pass them in to each of these programs. Okay? So we're going to take our original test that we ran against program P and we're going to run them against all of these mutants, P1 and so on. And from each of these, we're going to get a set of outputs. So let's call this outputs. I'm just going to put a little one here to denote this is outputs one. Okay. And then let's actually have the same thing again. And these are outputs two. And then down here we get outputs n. Okay, so we have here now our tests that we've run against our original program which have given us these outputs, okay? So we're going to assume all of these outputs are correct. So you can kind of think about these as correct outputs, okay? So these are all going to be green color. Let's say green for correct, okay? Now, Here's the, the tricky part is, is that when we run our tests against each program, what we're trying to do is figure out, can our tests tell the difference between this program P1 in, in the first case against the original? And what we're looking for is we're looking for seeing if any of the outputs are different. So maybe this one is different with P1. And maybe for P2, this one is different and this one is different. And maybe for PN, none of them are different. Okay, so let's this one here, they're all, these are green, meaning they're the same as the others. This one is green, this one is green here, and this one's green here. And in this one, it's green, 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 green. And now, with this output, what we can actually do is we can actually see that when we actually do a comparison here between those outputs and these outputs, what we can figure out is, is that in this case here, the first two, there's a difference. So these mutants, sorry, mutants P1, and P2 are killed. Okay? That means our test was able to find it. PN is alive. Okay? So that means that our tests are able to detect some of the mutant programs and at least one of them they're not, okay? And what we can do here is often we calculate something called the 
the mutant score, which equals the percent of mutants killed by the tests. Okay? So that's sort of what we're doing. In this case here, do we want a higher mut mutations? Actually, it's should be, I think it should be mutation score. I, I wrote that wrong, sorry. So in this case here, this is really important. Okay, so with this here, this do we want a higher or a lower uh, mutation score? Higher, right? So higher is better here because higher means that our tests are capable of detecting more of these mutant programs. Okay? So if, if we get a score, let's say we got a score of 70%, what are we going to do here? What does that mean? Well, that would mean that 30% of these mutant programs aren't detectable by our tests. But ideally we want a higher score. So what would we do if we had say only 70%? Or more specifically for this PN down at the bottom, which wasn't detected, what could we do here with PN? In other words, how do we kill PN? How do we do that? Well, we can figure out how do we create a test. So the solution here is, right? So our solution is create a new test that kills PN and add it to our test suite. And then what we can do is we can, if we do that, then what we can actually do is we can then, if we do this, we can then take the new tests with the new tests we added. So for example, maybe we add in a, another test over here. Let's, uh, let's say what we do is we create a new test and let's say it's this test, right? then what we can do here is we can add another test up here, right? And then we can now run this, get results. And then we run this new test against all of these. Get new results for the new test. And what we might find out is that in this case here now, well, the new test, we got the right result for it here, for here. But we might find out now that it failed here and it failed here, which means now PN is killed because we've added a new test. Does that make sense? Is it helpful seeing it drawn or is this too small or? What I'll do is I'll save this image and I'll actually upload it to the website as well so you have it as a resource. Okay, so let's just go back to the slides here now. So what we're doing here is basically we're trying to detect um, whether or not different mutants are killed and each mutant represents 
some syntactic fault, hopefully. There is something called equivalent mutants, but I'm not going to get into that uh, right now. Those are basically mutants where, although the program has changed syntactically, it behaves identically to the original, so you can't actually tell the difference. But for now, let's just assume we're looking at mutants that are all different. So in this case here, we want to try to kill as many of these as possible, and that will give us a good idea of our, the, our test adequacy, i.e. how good our tests are, by seeing how well they do at covering or detecting the seeded faults that we've put in. Now, another question you might have is, how do we actually seed faults? So that is something that obviously kind of stems from this, which is, okay, I've showed you the general approach, but I've glossed over, I haven't given you any details on how these mutants are created. Uh, and the way we do this is uh, we do this systematically, just like we would. So we go through is every line in the program we go through. And for every line in the program, we have a whole bunch of patterns, which are mutation operators, they're called. And these mutation operators each represent a common type of bug, okay? And usually you start with a taxonomy of existing bugs uh, that you know, so it's a systematic set of type of bugs. You have mutant generators, a mutant generator which has a mutation operator for each one of these types of bugs. So there's one, to, for every type of bug, you generate a, a type of mutant. As an example, change a less than to a less than or equal to. That would be an example. And what you do is you systematically go through with this set of mutation operators and you apply them to every line of the program where they can be applied. And this is how you generate all of these different mutations or mutants. And then you have a whole bunch of variations of the original program, which are each a mutant, which each have a single syntactic change. And you then can take your tests, run it against the original, and compare those results to each of the mutants to see if those tests can find it or not. Um, there are uh, different strategies for doing uh, mutation. So first off, there's a sort of a traditional mutation for sequential code, or uh, which um, includes sort of some very standard types of mutations. Uh, often mutations involve uh, mutating three different uh, pieces of information. Statements, okay, exchanging, deleting statements. Uh, another type is changing operators, okay. Um, that's like things like modifying the decisions, for example. Uh, the other one is changing operands. So variables, which could include things like this idea of value mutation here, where you change a constant value or something like that. Um, and um, the set of mutation operators that you traditionally use, uh, I'm not going to go through them in detail. I'll provide some links for you if you want. Uh, but there are also different types of mutation operators. For example, some of my original work that I did as a PhD student was on how do we actually do mutation for concurrent software? Because the types of bugs, the taxonomy of bugs for concurrency is unique and is not necessarily, doesn't happen in sequential code. Um, there's also a set of mutation operators for um, object-oriented um, code, which, which are um, examples of faults related to things like polymorphism, inheritance, uh, information hiding, that kind of thing. Um, and then there's also now mutation operators for a variety of stuff, for SQL, there's mutation operators for security, there's operators for a whole bunch of different contexts. It's, so you need to make sure you choose the right operators for your needs. Uh, and the way you would match the right operators is first the operators would, uh, some operators it's clear, like if you're doing object-oriented code, the object-oriented mutants might be useful. If you're doing concurrent code, concurrency mutants might be useful. Uh, but the way you really do it is by looking at the types of bugs that you're that are common in your system or that you're expecting in your system and you pick a mutation um, technique that generates bugs that are representative of the kind of bugs that are possible or expected in the software you're developing. Um, and if you're wondering, well, well, I haven't written code yet, how do I know which ones I need? You could even go and look at, for example, if there's an open source alternative or something like that, or a competitor or another product, an earlier product you've developed, you have an idea of what kind of bugs those products have. And that could be an indicator you can use for a new product. Okay, 
So let's look at the first example. So I have three examples here. The first one is value mutation. And in this one, what we're going to do is we're going to go through and mutate every constant in the program to be off by one. So you've ever heard of off by one errors. This is something we're dealing with. Um, so in this case here, we're going to go through and do this, and we're going to be done when every constant in the program has been mutated at least once. Um, so let's do an example here. Um, if you look at here, we have four constant values in this code, and this is our same code we've been using. Uh, just for some uh, simplicity, I've actually included the test examples on the sides here rather than break out and do them today. Um, but if you notice here, we have four constant values. We have 0, 0, 1, 0. So <clears throat> for each of these constants, what we're going to do here is um, we want to actually do mutation. So what we're going to do here is, remember, we're going to be evaluating our existing test suite. So let's say we have this test suite here on the right. And this test suite is statement coverage, okay? These three tests allow us to explore every line of code in this program, meaning every statement is executed by at least one test. So this is our test, and the yellow highlights where the constants are in the code. So what we would do is we would go, now I just changed it from 0 to 1 here, but typically what you would see is 0 plus 1 in brackets or something like that. But basically, I've created a mutant now which has that one constant changed. And I would do this for all four of these. And each one I do, I will run my original tests. And if I run my original test now with y equals 1, I can see here that the mutation output is different for every single test. So these tests clearly kill this mutant. Does that make sense? And if we go back to our diagram here, uh, we're, this that mutant could be P1 here, okay? So we could be talking about P1 in that case, okay? So this could be P1, okay? So that corresponds, P1 corresponds in this case to that one mutant. So that's what we've just seen, is we've seen a step through of one part of this process, okay? Now... Uh, the next thing we would do is we would actually go on, so that's one mutant. We would then go on and do the exact same thing with the next constant. Because remember, we're doing this systematically. And then we would look at the outputs with the mutants. And in this case, two of the three tests have different output. <coughs> we would then go on and do the next one. In this case, only one of the three tests has a different output. And then in the last one, one of the three tests again has a different output. So for the value mutation here of only, and this is only dealing with the constant, changing constants off by one, we can see that all three of our tests are actually able to kill or detect 100% of the mutants. Now, another type of mutation you can do is what's called decision mutation. Uh, and this is where you actually go through and you change all the greater thans to less than, all the equals to un not equals, and so on. Um, typically what you would do is you take every one of these and say, change every greater than to a less than, change every greater than to a less than equals to, every greater than to an equals, and so on and so forth. Um, but I'm just, I've simplified it just for the teaching purposes here. And we go about, we do this for every single one of these. So if we now go and look at our code again, we can walk through this, we can say, okay, well, the first line here used to say y equals zero, the first if, I've now changed it to not equal zero, and I can see if I do that, all of my tests give different outputs. If I move on to the next one, two of them get different outputs. The last one, one of them gives a different output. So we can see here again, these tests do pretty good with this. Uh, the last example I want to show you is uh, statement mutation. And in this case here, um, what you're going to do is you're going to go through and delete each statement in the program. So the idea of you accidentally omitting something. And you're going to have one mutant for every statement. You're going to be done when every statement has been deleted at least once, or deleted once. <coughs> now, just to keep in mind, statement level mutations might not be deletion. 
They could be interchanging two adjacent statements. They could be just shuffling a set of three or four. They could be duplicating a statement and so on. So there's other types of things you can do here. Um, let's just look at one example here. So let's say you'll notice what I did here was I got rid of the C print line. Y is zero. Now what I didn't do was I didn't just delete the line. I replaced it with a semicolon. Do you know what a semicolon is in this case? A semicolon is actually just means an empty statement. Okay, so it's a statement that doesn't do anything. So I put the semicolon here deliberately because if I had just deleted the statement and left this code, I've now put, first off it won't compile because my else if is now internal to my if statement, right? Because that's the next line of code. So I put the semicolon here to preserve that there was a statement here because since the if had no brackets around it, um, then just deleting it, not replacing it by anything, would actually change the meaning of the rest of the code, which is not what we intended. <coughs> and as you can see here, if we delete this statement, we actually get a different result in test one. And you could do this for every statement if you wanted to. Okay? Now, uh, a few, a few things I want to point out here. I've done this just as a simplified approach to show you. Uh, but one of the things I want to mention is, is that when you're doing this, you wouldn't just do one of these types of operators. You would typically do a set of operators, okay? And uh, the reason being is that you often wouldn't want to just evaluate your tests on one type of bug. You'd often want to evaluate them over the taxonomy of bugs and different bug types that you've identified, which have you allowed you to create the mutation operator. So uh, depending on the set, they could be as something as for like, for example, uh, um, there's a sufficient set, I think it's of seven of the muta these mutation operators. Um, there's also larger sets of 20 plus. Um, depending on the type of uh, bugs you're finding, there could be 30 even uh, or more. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that with each of these mutation operators, you're applying each of these operators exhaustively through your program. So everywhere they can be applied, you're creating a new version of the program. That means that with a larger program uh, and 20 operators say, you're going to end up with a lot of mutations, mutants, sorry. It could be hundreds or thousands. And this can actually make this type of technique a little cost prohibitive, meaning that it could be actually costly to evaluate. But it does give you some nice assurance about the quality of your test suite. So there's value in it, uh, but uh, how frequently you use it is something uh, that is, uh, you know, pro is, I don't want to say debatable, but it is something that is, uh, has to be assessed. And mutation testing is used sometimes in industry, but not often widely used. Uh, and part of the reason is the cost associated with it. Okay? Uh, the other um, thing is that mutation testing is something you can do to strengthen the existing types of coverage you have, whether they're black box coverage techniques like functionality input output or even whether they're white box tests like statement coverage. Uh, you can use it to assess and, and enhance the coverage by using two different coverage criteria together. Um, and, and this is something that's really good to keep in mind is that often combining these different coverage mechanisms, for example, a black box uh, coverage with something like mutation can really provide a lot of benefit and enhancement in making your test valuable. Um, <clears throat> so um, just as a summary, this lecture is a little bit shorter, but that's, that's okay. Um, but I just wanted to kind of summarize for you mutation testing as a white box method. Um, it can be utilized if you have, because you're automatically generating the output uh, for, from the original tests and comparing the mutant test output to the original program's output, it can be completely automated. So, there's, so while there's a lot of um, testing that goes on here because of the number of mutants, <coughs> the fact that it's fully automated does make up a little bit for sort of the amount of uh, testing that has to happen. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that typically mutants are, are simple syntactic variations that are also generated automatically. 
Uh, and typically, a typical mutant has only one syntactic change. However, there are there is work in what's called higher order mutants, where you actually combine different mutants together, and sometimes those can actually be more challenging to find uh, because one mutant can kind of obfuscate the uh, the other mutant, or one part. I guess one syntactic change can obfuscate another syntactic change in the program and make it um, harder to detect. Um, so this is just something to keep in mind. And uh, we, what we did today was we looked at three different examples of types of mutation. They are by no means exhaustive. They're not using these three alone would not be sufficient for doing mutation testing. Uh, but they do give you a nice indication and a nice understanding of how the mutant process and the mutation testing uh, works. So with that being said, um, I'll just ask if there's any questions right now. Hearing no questions, uh, I'll say we'll end the lecture and I'll, I'll take other questions related to the project and that.